cancer. Screening saves lives. It could really save your life. For more information, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Talk 1470, WWNN, Pompano Beach, Boca Raton, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Have you ever tried buying your own stocks? Then as soon as you buy them, they go down or just sit there. And then when you sell, they go back up. Learn the right way to trade and invest at Online Trading Academy in South Florida. Online Trading Academy is the brick-and-mortar school that teaches how to trade stocks, options, futures, and forex, and how money is made in up, sideways, and down markets while limiting risk. Learn with our money, not yours. Learn in a real classroom, one-on-one, by pros who are certified, currently trade, and are profitable. They show you what they do every day. Want to know why after you buy stocks they go down? Find out. Call and register for a free half-day class to see how smart trading works. Call Online Trading Academy in South Florida. Free half-day classes in Broward and now in Palm Beach. Call 561-674-9800. 561-674-9800. If you've decided to get back to feeling good again like you used to feel, then you're invited to tune in to the Dr. Bob Martin Show. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob. At your service, Sunday mornings at 10 on Talk 1470 WNN. Talk health, talk wealth, talk politics. Talk 1470 WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Are you a family caregiver? Are you caregiving for someone who can no longer take care of themselves? Are you overwhelmed? This is Caregiver Solutions Info with Marsha Teal. Marsha will be hosting an hour of true stories and information, tips and updates of the latest research and necessary information in the caregiving field, focusing on you, the family caregiver. An Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert, Marsha has 15 years of hands-on experience at Arden Courts, a leader in assisted living dementia communities here in the U.S. Marsha covers everything you need to know as a family caregiver, especially if you care for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease or other related dementia or chronic illness. If you have a friend or relative that is also a family caregiver, call them now. They won't want to miss a minute. And let them know they can watch on caregiversolutions.info. And they can listen on WNN 1470 AM in South Florida or nationally on the iHeartRadio app. Now, sit back, relax, and learn from our host, Marsha Teal, as she brings information to you that may just be the caregiving solution you need. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Caregiver Solutions Info. I'm so happy that you joined us this evening. I have a wonderful show planned for you, as usual. I'm so excited that you're here. This show was designed for you, the family caregiver. If you're caring for someone, especially someone with some form of dementia, then you'll want to make sure that you tune in every week, either on the radio, WNN 1470 AM, or on the Internet at caregiversolutions.info to learn about things that could help you in your everyday caregiving challenges. And it is a challenge. Caregiving is not easy. Matter of fact, it's hard. And so this show is designed to give you tips, give you information from experts in their field, great advice that you can pass on to other people, and it's all about education. Uh, The more education caregivers have, the better off everybody will be, not only the caregiver, but the person you're caring for. So thank you again for joining us. Today is Tuesday, December 1st, 2015, and this week we're going to be discussing non-clinical caregiving and what that means and what you need to know in order to be an effective caregiver. But before we get to that, we always have our weekly Brain Boosters. What is Brain Boosters? Brain Boosters is a tip, some information that we share with you to either improve your cognition, to improve your memory, or to help you retain the memory that you already have. And who doesn't want to do that? So let me ask you, have you ever heard, it's on the tip of my tongue, ay, 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 
and you see somebody across the room and you know that you know their name and you're struggling to figure out who they are, uh, their name, you know who they are, you know you know them, you're not sure maybe exactly from where, and I know his name, I know his name. Well, I'm going to give you a little tip of how to try to remember someone's name uh, easier, and you can practice this for yourself. And the way you want to try to do this is by word association and imagery. And if you put those two things together, then it'll help you when you see somebody to trigger that brain response to help you come up with the right name of that person. So how do you do this? Well, the best way I can explain to you is to give you a couple illustrations. And these are personal illustrations that I um, have actually used, and it has helped me. And some of these illustrations I came up with over 20 years ago, and I still remember them today, although I don't even see the person anymore. But I do remember um, how I remember their name. So, for instance, let me tell you about Clay. Now, I met a fellow named Clay, and it was a very noisy party. It was a lot of people, um, you know, wanted to remember his name and because uh, he was uh, friends of friends of friends. And so I thought, how am I going to remember that? I don't know anybody else with that name. And then I learned a little bit about this particular person. And I heard that, you know, unfortunately, he did dirty by his ex-wife. And that was a little bit of gossip on the side. But I kind of used it to my advantage. And I thought, dirty. He was dirty to his wife, and dirt reminds me of Clay. So now, when I think of him, I know his name is Clay. Now, that's just a little bit of a, a way that you can associate. Unfortunately, that was not a real positive thing, but it did help me to remember. Another positive one, though, I can share with you is I met another fella, and his name was Les. And again, how am I going to remember his name? So when he smiled, uh, he had a big grin. And he had some wide spaces between his teeth. And I thought, oh, you know, he doesn't have a whole a lot of teeth. He has less teeth. And so when I see him and I see less teeth in his mouth, it reminds me that his name is Les. Now, I know these things sound silly, but whatever it takes to help you remember something, you know, why not do it? And so try for yourself Play around with it. See if you can think of something that's going to remind you about a new person. Eventually, you know, you see them enough and talk to them enough and you will remember. But that initial um, contact is very crucial. You want to pick up on something. You know, maybe they have red hair and, and their name is Robin, so it reminds you of a, a red-breasted Robin. Whatever it, 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 it happens to be, it happens to be. And these are just little fun tricks, but they do work. And so... I challenge you to try that next time you meet somebody. Try to find some type of imagery, something about them that you can kind of connect to their name that reminds you of something that's going to relate back to their name. Uh, it, it is a challenge, and it will work your brain because you're going to be working your brain to figure it out, so it's a little exercise for your brain. So I challenge you this week to try that on somebody. And so we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking to an expert on non-family, non-caregiving, that's clinical, non-clinical caregiving. That's a mouthful. We'll learn about that. Stay tuned. Make First Choice your first choice for home health care. First Choice is state certified for Medicare coverage services such as medical treatment and rehabilitation. Qualified healthcare professionals come to your home and work closely with your doctor to build a care plan designed to get you back on your feet as soon as possible. Founded and operated by registered nurses, First Choice Home Health is dedicated to providing exceptional home health care. Their highly skilled medical professionals have the knowledge and ability to provide patients quality care. Call First Choice Home Health at 561 296 2770. That's 561-296-2770. And tell them you want them as your first choice. Take a pen and jot down this information. Right from the Heart assists families in finding the right living arrangements for their aging parents. Founded in 2012 by Sharon Agate, Senior Lifestyle Consultant, Sharon has counseled seniors and their families for over 20 years in clinical settings and in independent assisted living and memory care communities. Finding the right community can be overwhelming and time-consuming. Right from the heart takes the stress and worry from you. 
Sharon will meet with mom or dad and evaluate their needs and lifestyle preferences and create a personalized plan at no cost to you. She will accompany you to visit selected communities and guide you every step of the way so you can be assured you're making a well-informed decision. Call Sharon at 561-374-4696. Sharon's promise to you is in your knowing that her advice will always come right from the heart. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal, an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marsha. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. And we're back with Caregiver Solutions Info. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to thank our national sponsor for helping to make this program possible, Arden Court's Memory Care Community. Arden Courts has over 50 communities throughout the United States, and they specialize in Alzheimer's and dementia care. And so they see the value in educating caregivers. And one of the things that Arden Courts would like to give you as a family caregiver is an opportunity to get a little bit of respite. Respite is a time for you. It's a time for your loved one. It's a time for each of you to have a rest, to take a break from each other, because believe it or not, uh, your loved one probably needs a break from you as much as you need from them. And so if you were to call Arden Courts, wherever you are, hopefully there's one near you, the toll-free number is available for you to call and find out all the details about respite care. Arden Courts would like to give you a free day of respite. This way you can take time for yourself, plan some fun events, and not worry because your loved one will be in a safe, secure environment because Arden Courts knows and understands dementia and they can help you. So all you have to do is call the toll-free number, which is 888-478-2410, and tell them that you heard about the free respite day from the Caregiver Solutions Info Program. And they'll hook you up and give you all the information that you need and give you all the details. And it would be a wonderful thing for both of you, your care, the caregiver and the patient. So give them a call and let them know that uh, you're interested and that's all you have to do. So today we have a very exciting program. We're going to be talking about family caregiving, but in a non-clinical manner. And today, in order for us to learn about that, I have a very special guest. His name is David Levy, and David is a gerontologist, a Florida Supreme Court-approved family caregiver mediator. He's also a family caregiver himself. He is also a support group facilitator and an author, and he is the president and founder of the American Association of Caregiver Education. Hi, David. Hi, Marcia. How are you? That is a lot of credentials, and I know that I didn't even say all of them. Well, but it's unimportant. <laughs> <laughs> well, the important thing is that you're here today. I'm very excited that you could join us because you have so much knowledge and so much to share because I know you've been doing this for over 20 years. And close to 30. Close to 30 now. Well, I have known you about uh, 15, so right. we'll tack that on. And, you know, you have actually a following of people um, that love to uh, learn from you, uh, your expertise, your knowledge. And so today we're going to be talking about family caregiving in a non-clinical situation. And I want to share this um, to our viewers um, of you that are looking on the uh, web and those of you that aren't I will tell you this is a manual that um, David has authored it's called family caregiver practical problem solving manual how to plan for and solve the 85 percent of family caregiving that is non-clinical so you actually put it all together several right. years ago uh, in this manual and tell me why you even attempted this and what is non-clinical caregiving? Okay, um, I'll answer the second part first. Uh, non-clinical caregiving is all of the things that a caregiver has to be aware of that have very little to do with what I'll call bedpan patrol. Of course, we need to understand 
something about the disease so that we're not ignorant. And so in this case, we'll deal with dementia for the moment because it's a subject that both you and I are very familiar with. It's important to know about dementia or Alzheimer's specifically, but what in a non-clinical sense, all right, especially when you have a loved one at home or for that matter, a loved one in Arden Court, while there's somebody taking care of them more or less from a clinical perspective in terms of their, their needs, it's all of the other things that a caregiver has to do, fight the system, deal with the doctors, get all that legal paperwork arranged, do I have my durable powers of attorney, do I have my advanced health care directives, just when you think you understand what's expected of you from the VA, they change the rules, uh, they're, they're too busy, they can't do this, they can't do that. So one of the most frustrating things that a caregiver has to deal with is figuring out the system true. and how they're going to deal with it because it's always a work in progress. That's true. So when you, when you look at it from that perspective, and, and I got involved in caregiving back in 1988. Um, and after a career in the real estate business, because after too many booms and busts, and you know this, I, I said to myself, what is encyclical aging? All right. And when I realized that, um, I decided to get into uh, more of understanding not only what was aging, which is why I went back and got my degrees in gerontology, because I started life as a as an attorney who didn't really practice law, but I was involved in the real estate business. Big switch between one and the well, other. Well, because it was something that I had a real passion for, and not that I didn't enjoy the real estate business, but um, at that time, there were brand new industries first getting started, and I was very lucky. When I first got started, I created a company called Adult Care. And <clears throat> within a year of starting it, I was acquired by one of the largest insurance companies that was selling long-term care insurance. And they wanted us to support the family when their client or the insured went into claim. So you were on the forefront because, you know, back then that was a very, very new concept. Right. As a matter of fact, we were so far out in front of the Indians, I had arrows in my back. <laughs> <laughs> but... The bottom line was that one of the great advantages to me at the time was I had an insurance company's wallet to explore and permission to go after and understand the family caregiver. So at a time when it was barely even a name or a concept that was understood, um, we were already talking to 90 or 100,000 people that were already part of folks that were insured through the insurance company. And then we set up a contact and a call center, all right, and, and we designed software. And after a while, we knew what a caregiver was going to say before they even opened up their mouth. Right, so. because when you're dealing with it day in and day out and you're in um, the midst of it and you meet a caregiver, you can pretty much know what they're going through when, like, right. you and I have the experience with caregivers on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. I can name that tune in one note. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they look at you sometimes when you, 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 you might tell even them tell them going. what they're going through. And well, they're like, how did you know that? You've never met me before. You don't know my husband. How did you know that? Right. And that's what Be you're talking about. even though when you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, um, you've seen one case. What caregivers go through has a lot of repetitious uh, things that occur, even though they're a unique fingerprint depending on the caregiver, the relationship, family dynamics, all, right. of the, all the things that make up caregiving. But at the same time, all those things that make up the relationship, family, dollars, understanding literacy, not only literacy in terms of your own educational capability, but literacy in terms of dealing with, quote, the system. Mm -hmm. And learning about the progression and what's to come because right. it doesn't stop today. You're always looking to the future of knowing how to handle what's coming down the right. road. And so what I realized after a number of years was that people didn't know and everybody was kind of reinventing the wheel. And while there had been a number of books written about individual experiences, uh, Dr. Peter Rabin from uh, Johns Hopkins had written The 36-Hour Day, which was the Bible. Right. But it was yet, even though he was a very qualified neurologist who was talking about the disease and his relationship and how he took care of his mother, 
It was his story. Right. Everybody right? has their individual story. And everybody story. has their own story. And everyone who's written a book about their experiences as a caregiver, while it's important for people to realize that they're not alone, sometimes there isn't really the guidance in what they did that actually lends itself to your situation. Somebody taking care of their mother who may have had a lot of money in a celebrity setting mm -hmm. is not the same thing as somebody struggling to take care of their father and are trying to hold down two jobs to make ends meet, uh, as well as maybe raising kids or whatever other circumstances. Absolutely. So caregiving takes on every flavor um, that one might imagine. So. Uh, a number of years ago, I started to put down the things that I thought were important. And es essentially what began to happen, it evolved as a how-to manual. Not how specifically should you do this, mm -hmm. but things that you have to think about and consider. And then it was rolled up into what I call <clears throat> the caregiver action plan. What do you need to do? And, and, and essentially inside of the book, which has been readapted since it first came out in 2010 and, and it won awards from the Department of Elder Affairs and, uh, you know, the Aging Network, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the important thing. The important thing was that those that were using it found it effective. It was not respectfully psychobabble or medispeak because caregiving is not just one one disease it Correct. can run the gamut from anything from alzheimer's to, and addiction to cancer to autism to cancer you know or, or whatever you may be enmeshed in. so they could find themselves in the right. workbook and decide what was applicable to them exactly and it was almost like a worksheet a check -off. right and that's exactly what it is it's worksheets and checkoffs and um and so I was very lucky earlier this year I was contacted by a division of a major publisher uh, from something called Central Recovery Press and what they did is they optioned the book. Wonderful. Right. That's great. I, I didn't even tell you that <laughs> until I saw <laughs> I know your this five is your minutes. coming out party. Well, this, <laughs> yeah, well, because see this way if you actually have a book published that isn't vanity press, you know, where you're publishing it yourself, you can run for president. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're just finishing up the final edit, and I must tell you, dealing with professional editors, you know, who have style books, and these things have to be said this way and that way, versus what I'll call practical speak for the caregivers has been a clash of, of culture, so to speak. And uh, But it will all be finished in the next two weeks. I sent back six chapters in the last couple of days and I'm doing it in conjunction with a woman by the name of Brenda Bryan who's a wonderful editor and has been involved with me for the la last number of years and she edits most of the things that I write and do so she had things pretty much in ship shape order matter of fact they said they rarely had a manuscript that was that easy to work from well, and congratulations I, thank you. that's very exciting I so can't wait so it's going to go to press in 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 uh, January we just heard back from the marketing people because they'd had conversations with the marketers. They're going to be putting the book out. They loved the cover design, They, you know, which I had very little to do with. What I did when they sent me five selections for covers, I put it out to every caregiver I knew. I said, what do you like? I said, not a question of what I like. What's the consumer want? That's and right. it seemed to be the, you know, the hands-down favorite. And they loved the topic. And because it wasn't another how I took care of my mom book. Right. So it, essentially you took the manual and I, converted it into a, it, it's a hardcover? Right. And and so it's it's required some adaptation because in a, the eight and a half by 11 loose leaf notebook form that I've historically done as part of what I'll call Vanity Press and going to Sir Speedy and producing it, uh, we had to make adaptations. So one of the things that the book will have with it is essentially... Um, actually, it's going to have a little hard drive in it, 
All right, that ha your flash drive, rather, that, that's inside the book. Tell me that's for your personal information? Yeah, so uh -huh. that you can, you know, in other words, because as part of the plan, you know, you don't just do a plan once. A plan is a living thing that constantly has to adapt. Has to be adjusted for the times, right. the situation. Right, and you may be taking care of your grandmother today and your spouse tomorrow, or God forbid your kid has some disease or gets hit by a truck and now you're dealing or comes back from the military with PTSD. That's right. All right, so you need to be able to kind of create You've got to be flexible. When you're a caregiver, I mean, the first you thing you got to... You get up in the morning and you count your fingers and toes, essentially, <laughs> and say, what... What happened last night that's going to change the game on me today? Yeah, you have to be flexible. There's no, you know, rigidity because if sure as shooting, you go to plan A and then that's going to be struck out. You better have plan B and plan C right. and plan D. And, and when you're so close to the problem, as you well know, and emotionally involved, you can't be your own AWAC. You know, you, you can't be, you know, have a perspective for what's going on, and especially when it's your own family member. So this is kind of like a perspective that turns around and says, hey, this isn't telling you, as I said before, exactly what you're supposed to do. This fleshes out everything that's a component of mm -hmm. what you need to know. And here's how you approach analyzing it, prioritizing it, putting it into usable pieces and chunks. It takes the emotion out of it. Like yes, you said, and it allows you to have kind of breadcrumbs on the path, so to speak, that mm -hmm. you can follow, and anywhere along the way that it doesn't fit for you, get rid of it. Right. You know, it, there's no one that says that all caregiving works this way. That's right. But when you talked about education in order to create a, a usable way for a caregiver to deal with their issues, they all have to come back at some point and say, how do I analyze what my, my loved one needs? What have they done? Where have they been? What are their experiences? It's not just what doctors do they see and what medications, although yeah, that's important. it's all about important. who they are. Culturally, what they're all about. Yeah. What's going to make them be comfortable as they... How do you get buy-in with them? You right. know, not everybody has a cognitive problem. And so if you're dealing with mom or dad and they're still hitting on all eight and there are issues because they have heart disease, they've got chronic diabetes and something that, you know, may may have them in a wheelchair or not functioning, but yet they're they're right on. Mm -hmm. You gotta be able to create and you know getting into arguments over the way you think they should live their lives. That's pretty tough, you know, yeah. because you know, the, you're the adult child. Yep. You're talking to your parents, you know, it's almost like parenting your parents because mm -hmm. they they need it, you know. I mean, they may be high functioning. They may not have any real cognitive issues. Maybe a little mild cognitive impairment right. as people age. But still, you know, they know what they want, mm -hmm. and you have to try to accommodate them as much as possible to to make them happy. But at the same time, no, keep try the and deal with their issues yes. in an intelligent way. And yes. I'm not demeaning their intelligence, but sometimes. We get very fixed in our ways, you know, and one of the things um, as a gerontologist, somebody who studies aging, and as we well know, there was a very famous psychologist by the name of Eric Erickson who talks about the stages of aging. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, you know, and, and it goes all the way back. At 15, we decide we know more than our parents. Oh, yeah, I remember right? those days. And then about 25 to 35, we realized they were a hell of a lot smarter than we <laughs> thought they were. But... You cannot relate, even though you think you know your parents very well or you know your grandparents or whatever, but yet somebody who's lived 70 years of life has a different set of experiences than somebody who's only lived 45. And so there's always this culture class based on age and what you've experienced and done. And so this kind of calls out a way to look at it in, in much more of a dispassionate light in terms of what they're going through as opposed to what you perceive it to be. Well, I know that's very, very helpful because some caregivers have no clue even where to begin. And so we all need a starting point. Right. And I and know that's this, what this is. It, it is. It's a great starting point. I know that um, a lot of caregivers have used the problem-solving manual to... Um, kind of get the other family members involved. There's a lot of good practical advice here. Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, David Levy is going to tell us um, about who is a caregiver and are you one? So stay tuned. Take a pen and jot down this information. Right from the Heart assists families in finding the right living arrangements for their aging parents. Founded in 2012 by Sharon Agate, Senior Lifestyle Consultant, Sharon has counseled seniors and their families for over 20 years in clinical settings and in independent assisted living and memory care communities. Finding the right community can be overwhelming and time-consuming. Right from the Heart takes the stress and worry from you. Sharon will meet with mom or dad and evaluate their needs and lifestyle preferences and create a personalized plan at no cost to you. She will accompany you to visit selected communities and guide you every step of the way so you can be assured you're making a well-informed decision. Call Sharon at 561-374-4696. Sharon's promise to you is in your knowing that her advice will always come right from the heart. Do you need the advice of an elder law attorney but perhaps find it difficult or overwhelming getting to appointments? The solution is the Elder Law Department. They bring elder law to you by meeting with you in the comfort of your own surroundings to discuss your personal situation and family needs. In practice since 1994, Heidi Friedman is a member of the Elder Law section of the Florida Bar. She and her team help families with issues that include incapacity and estate planning, asset preservation, veterans benefits, and other legal issues that seniors may face. Call the Elder Law Department at 954-383-1143. 954-383-1143. They bring Elder Law to you. Arden Courts is not just a place to live. It's a place to call home. Residential living combined with quality caregiving. This is the philosophy behind Arden Courts. Communities created exclusively for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia who would benefit from a safe and structured environment. For additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides, call 888-478-2410 to locate a community nearest you. Inquire about our educational seminars, resource library, or support groups, or simply feel free to ask questions you may have about Alzheimer's and related dementias. At Arden Courts, we know, we understand, and we can help because memory care is all we do. Remember, call 888-478-2410 for additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal, an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marcia. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. And we're back here in the studio with David Levy, who's a gerontologist, a family caregiver, a support group facilitator for caregivers, an author, and he's been sharing his expertise on caregiving and the non-clinical, practical problem solving that he has shared with caregivers. And we're sharing it now today with you. So, David, we've been talking about what is non-clinical caregiving. But I want to ask you a question. Sure. Some family caregivers don't even realize that they're a caregiver. Um, especially ones that maybe have already placed a loved one, um, you know, in a nursing home. They think, okay, I'm not really the caregiver, but that's not necessarily true, is it? No. Um, you may have changed the roof from home to a facility, but you haven't changed the responsibility. Matter of fact, when somebody goes into a facility, and, and we know this well, I mean, Arden is spectacular in terms of the care that you get there but i'm not sure that we can say that for every memory facility and, and every you know assisted living um because this is a growth industry mm -hmm. and um and so in trying to keep up with the demand in an aging society i mean every day we turn out a new group of folks that that can use or need um, facility based it's exploding care. it's just the baby boomers are aging right. and it's exploding right and so 
Um, one of the things that we have to be aware of then is that simply because you have entrusted somebody else to do, let's say, the immediate heavy lifting, meals, toileting, you know, bathing, etc., mm -hmm. it still doesn't mean that all of the other things that need to be done in terms of double checking to make sure and, and, and I'm going to keep it inside of you know the things you wouldn't think about it but how many times have we dealt with in in other locations uh, health care providers that come in and just kind of pay a little bit of lip service to what might be needed or um, somebody goes off to the ER one night and comes back and they've been unhooked from their medication or things have been changed. And, you, and no one's there to follow up or right. follow through necessarily so as in a some care, cases. Right. So as a caregiver, you have to be your loved one's advocate. advocate. All right. Mm -hmm. the, and, and, See, and, I knew what you were going to say. Right. <laughs> well, it's not a new subject for either of us. But the point remains is that if you're not there for oversight, how can we expect somebody who we placed in a facility, they can't go back out and say, well, show me my records, or for that matter, inside of a memory situation or any one of the related dementias, be expected to know, recall, and then advocate for themselves. So going back to the, to the previous question, what's a caregiver? A caregiver is anyone who's responsible for taking care of somebody who can no longer do for themselves that which they used to be able to do or possibly never could i mean if you have a down syndrome child who doesn't really progress intellectually uh or even physically well uh during their lifetime you've been a caregiver from day one right all right and you will never not be a caregiver even though you may find facility care etc all the way through i have clients of mine and friends and family who've had children that were born with special needs that have had 50, 60 years of caregiving at this point. Right. They're all just, right. that's and, and, all And so known. many of us get thrown into it. You know, the classic is the phone call at night. Dad slipped and fell. He's in the ER. Um, and then, you know, somebody jumps on a plane because mom may or may not be in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and they come down, they arrive at the ER, and who are you? All right, well, I'm the child. Yeah, well, show me your paperwork because HIPAA says I can't talk to you. Right. Uh, HIPAA being the laws that protect our privacy inside of clinical settings. So is this the time now to figure out how you're going to deal and get a document prepared and signed and executed by your loved one and advanced health care directors? That's not the time during a crisis. No, and even so, as a practical matter, suppose that you did have their advanced health care directives that say, if I'm unable, this is what I want. How do you know what they want? You never sat down and had the discussion, what is it that you want? And, and somebody may say, I don't want any intervention if I reach the point where, you know, they're, they're giving me last rights. I don't want any, you know, heroics or anything else like that. And you may feel, I got to do everything I can to keep dad alive. Right. And um, now you have a clash. Right. And, and so, uh, part of having things in writing and having had a prior discussion is not having to worry that you're going to make a mistake or that for your loved one that somebody's not going to come in and throw a monkey wrench into what they expected to have happen right under these circumstances it's the same thing even with pre-need funeral Yes, because Taking you, you know you're going to need it, right? right. Taking you know the, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, eventually we're, we're all going to be there. Right. So what do you want? What can you do? Who's mm -hmm. paid for it? There's nothing worse than getting a phone call that says, oh, my God, somebody's passed. And now what do you now do? Do? It's you do? It's a Chinese fire yeah, drill. Yeah, we had um, pre-planned funeral arrangement talk on the show uh, several weeks ago mm -hmm. and things you don't even think about. So it sounds like... Um, especially adult children right. who have parents that are still living, it sounds like they will um, have to be a caregiver at some point right. in their parents' life. Even if life. it's not day-to-day -day in the trenches, if you wind up having the responsibility, young or old, for somebody else, and you haven't thought about, and not just assume, who they are, what they need, what's going on in their lives, both from pure structure all right as well as what might be what's needed i mean you can know somebody and i'll just give you a practical 
you know, because I, I was dealing with this situation not very long ago. There was uh, a woman whose husband was in the military. She was in her late 20s, early 30s. He had just finished his second tour in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. all right, even though we supposedly pulled out of there. And the vehicle he was in one night was, they ran over an IED, you yeah, know, yeah, the yeah. usual horror story. Yes. Well, the person she knew was not the person that came back, mm -hmm. all right? Brain and damage. She, right, and, and uh, she had just had a, a child because in between his first and second tour, she got pregnant. So here she was. She had two other kids, a newborn baby, and arrives home or brought home, even though he cycled through the VA facility, was somebody that not only was emo was not only physically injured but was deeply emotionally injured, and um, it has been an absolute disaster for her. And even though we would hope that things like the VA and other special services that we would hope are available, there's very little caregiving support, even for the military. And when you do, unfortunately, and I mean this very respectfully, it's maybe psychological support, social worker support, stuff. You know, who's going to get you a wheelchair? Who's going to do this? Mm -hmm. Who's going to do that? Can we, can we get them into this particular program? But the day-to-day, -day, how am I going to handle well, things? That's what everybody struggles right. with I, I as a caregiver, the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. How do I do how that? Do I, how do I do this? Well, you right. know, I always say when um, someone has decided to move their loved one into a community um, that they're sharing the caregiving. Yes. And they're not giving it up entirely. They're sharing it. They finally allowed themselves to share, to give up part of the responsibility right. I call it the heavy lifting right you and, know and they're sharing that responsibility with the uh, team at the particular community however you're always a caregiver you don't you don't stop sometimes to think well who's still gonna pay the bills right. who's gonna address the letters who's going to make certain appointments mm -hmm. that they have to make you're still doing for this person and it might not be on a medical um, subject like you said with medications and follow-up right with different although things. that's pretty critical but that's, and cri and that's critical that. it depends on the place that you're at whether you right. feel confident that they can are handling it right. and and um, and of course that's why I'm at Arden Courts for 15 years because right. you know I'm confident in in our abilities in what you're doing but you know not not every place has what an Arden We're, Courts has but not only the medical but the day-to-day -day. what about mom needs more underwear okay right. the facility's not going to go shopping to buy the underwear no. you're still the caregiver that person still depends Ken, on you no and no pun intended I, <laughs> yeah but you know it's not it's the little things as well as the big right. things well as you well know for i don't know probably a decade now i've been doing um the family support groups the first and third Friday and in Arden Court. And you do many other support groups. Right, and but, uh, but I'll take Arden as a perfect example because it's a great facility. But yet, caregivers, and even when they passed the responsibility, made that roof change, as it were, now you're first dealing with something that's called placement guilt. All right? And the caregiver turns around and says, did I put him in too soon? Did Shouldn't I, do I the have right, endured more the at right home? Thing. Yes. Should I? Was I not a martyr enough? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know one of the things that I tell people uh, when trying to evaluate yourself as a family caregiver, first of all, there's nobody that's Mother Teresa and Florence Nightingale homogenized together. All right. B. We all because we there are many times we don't know what's expected of us. We think that everything is expected of us. So we set the bar mm -hmm. so high that the only thing that's going to come out of caregiving is not only a wounded ego, but a very bruised tush because you can't make it over the bar and you're destined to keep falling. People are so hard on themselves. And because they don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, there was a time, even, even with child rearing, you know, you had your first kid, but at least maybe you had the Spock book. To, to put a little bit, you know, and then when you have your second child, you're already a veteran. But when it comes to caregiving and the first time you're in, all right, and it's not as intuitive as child raising That's and child true. rearing, 
all right, because you've got a whole bundle of things. First of all, you may have other family members involved with you, and you and your siblings may not have gotten along. You may have issues from the sandbox. Mom liked you better, all right? And so now you're both tasked with the responsibility of dealing with issues, and you can't resolve your own. And that's where, as a mediator, involved in almost exclusively family caregiving. And that's really not uncommon. No. And y you got to turn around and say, look, you guys, we're never going to resolve your sandbox issues, to, mm -hmm. to use that expression again. But it's not about the two of you. It's about mom. Mm -hmm. And we need to make decisions for her. And the two of you are just going to have to realize that we're not here to settle your issues. We're here to find solutions for mom and dad or and whatever. And every family the, has those special, absolutely. special family dynamics. Yep. Family um, dynamics and, and the conflict of family dynamics. A number of years ago, I went to Eckert College and I got certified in family conflict dynamics. And believe me, it is a whole subject unto itself. And just when you think you understand family dynamics... Somebody looks at somebody the wrong way, <laughs> and everything that you thought was going smoothly goes, see, you're still doing the same stuff you did. All right, now you're back at the beginning. Right, so it makes it hard. I mean, it's hard enough, but then you add all these other things right. into it, and, you know, your, your manual, and I can't wait for your book to come out. Yeah, well, we, we changed a bunch of things because what was good for caregiving last year mm -hmm is different this year. Well, there's always a new version. There's always new information. You right. always want to update, and I'm glad right. that you did. So we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with more information for you, the caregiver. Stay tuned. Do you need the advice of an elder law attorney, but perhaps find it difficult or overwhelming getting to appointments? The solution is the Elder Law Department. They bring elder law to you by meeting with you in the comfort of your own surroundings to discuss your personal situation and family needs. In practice since 1994, Heidi Friedman is a member of the Elder Law section of the Florida Bar. She and her team help families with issues that include incapacity and estate planning, asset preservation, veterans benefits, and other legal issues that seniors may face. Call the Elder Law Department at 954-383-1143. 954-383-1143. They bring elder law to you. Make First Choice your first choice for home health care. First Choice is state certified for Medicare covered services such as medical treatment and rehabilitation. Qualified healthcare professionals come to your home and work closely with your doctor to build a care plan designed to get you back on your feet as soon as possible. Founded and operated by registered nurses, First Choice Home Health is dedicated to providing exceptional home health care. Their highly skilled medical professionals have the knowledge and ability to provide patients quality care. Call First Choice Home Health at 561-296-2770. That's 561-296-2770. And tell them you want them as your first choice. Arden Courts is not just a place to live. It's a place to call home. Residential living combined with quality caregiving. This is the philosophy behind Arden Courts. Communities created exclusively for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia who would benefit from a safe, and structured environment. For additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides, call 888-478-2410 to locate a community nearest you. Inquire about our educational seminars, resource library, or support groups, or simply feel free to ask questions you may have about Alzheimer's and related dementias. At Arden Courts, we know, we understand, and we can help because memory care is all we do. Remember, call 888-478-2410 for additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal, an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marsha. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. Hi, and welcome back. We're talking with David Levy about everything caregivers need to know to be an effective caregiver. 
to solve your caregiving problems in a non-clinical situation and how to do it with practical problem solving. So, David, I, I appreciate all this great information. Your manual is great. I, your book's coming out soon. You're educating and helping to educate the family caregiver. But I know that you have a new project recently that you have uh, uh, been very excited about, and so am I, to share. And it's not just about the family caregiver um, with their parent and a grandparent. Um, it's It re really is a family. When you're talking about especially dementia and Alzheimer's, it is really a family disease. It does affect everybody. Sure. So you're going a step I want to say beyond, but I really want to say backwards because backwards meaning your younger and younger people need to know about what they might be facing. So tell me about this new endeavor that you have educating students. All right. Well, I can say that I was the original pioneer. When I was uh, running adult care, I had a woman by the name of Connie Ford, now Connie Siskowski. And when I created the American Association for Caregiver Education, she kind of went in a slightly different direction and created the Medi American Association for Young Caregivers, or Young Carers, which is what they call it in England. And she has been very successful in raising the awareness of what children go through. And when I say children, I'm, I'm talking not only young children, but adolescents, et cetera, um, to the fact that their caregivers as well in many many situations and many times what happens with kids is that they're called into action without even understanding why mm -hmm. um, they have a brother or a sister um, for argument's sake who's born after they are who has special needs and I'm, I'm just using that example again but we can plug and play anything that you want um, that have older brothers and sisters who maybe have addictions, all right? And once again, somebody's got to be responsible. And a lot of times kids aren't even told that, and they just are called into action. But children um, are entitled to understand what's going on as well. And just saying Freddie is special doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. And they go through a lot of stresses. Uh, uh, a number of years ago, probably five or six years ago, just to quickly digress, Connie contacted the Palm Beach County School Board, which puts out a questionnaire over the summer for sophomores and juniors. And she got them to ask a couple of very relevant questions, including, are you a caregiver? Are you responsible for, for the well-being of somebody else who can't do it for themselves? Sure. It could be a grandparent. Well, even. and it really doesn't make a difference. And the answers can overwhelmingly came back, yes. And then the next question was, is it interfering with your schoolwork? And that was another overwhelming yes. So the school board was kind of put on notice that caregiving is going on, and I don't think they realized it until Connie got them to ask the question. And the, the problem is that what do you do now that you know that? So through some folks... Um, that I do some other things related to caregiving in the Caribbean, all right? Um, I, this past, two weeks ago, I spoke at Dwyer High School up in the Jupiter area, mm -hmm. and I had, oh, probably upwards of 150 students who were sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Now, not all of them were specifically caregivers? No, no, but okay, in when, general. You ask, when you ask for a show of hands... Uh, and you kind of pose it in the way that I've just said, are you dealing with somebody inside your household? Or it doesn't, in many communities, you have what's called fictive kin. You know, this is uncle so-and-so or auntie so-and-so, and it's not really a family member, but yet you're kind of thrown into the responsibility of helping take care of that individual. But anyway, and I was very lucky because it was inside the school setting, mm -hmm. and they had to turn their phones off. So That's I didn't great. have to compete with texting. <laughs> That's All great. Right? And I must tell you, they were so responsive and so attentive and asked such great questions about caregiving and where did I see it going. And one of the things I said, you know, when I went to school, which was 138 years ago, um, there were two things that happened extracurricular. It was home ec for girls, and Sports you learned how to boys. sew and fry eggs. <laughs> and it was shop 
for boys, mm -hmm. and you learn how to make a birdhouse. Mm -hmm. All right, and and I was saying to them, it's going to be real important that we change those to having an awareness of family caregiving, because in an aging society, one of the things that we're seeing is that the ratio of let's say direct family members for caregiving is falling and uh, where it used to be five or six to one we're down to about three to one of family members who can care for it because many of them are now responsible for taking care of themselves right all right and they can't be called into action so it begins to fall back on a younger generation mm -hmm. and they're willing they are a very caring generation, millennials and, and even those that are coming up immediately behind them. But once again, they don't know what to do. So if you can talk to them at a formative age mm -hmm. and, and make them understand what's expected of them and that they're not supposed to be doctors and nurses, but they do need to be part of a family solution. And they were very, very receptive to that. And some of the follow-ons are going to be that I'm going in and doing some very specific, not just having a general discussion with them, but going in and, and also some of the teachers are very interested in how to approach caregiving on a high school level. Well, especially there's, I'm sure, a lot of absenteeism mm -hmm. with students. The same things that you see in business happen in school. Yes. Your mom's sick. You don't go to work. Call that in day. sick. I got to take care of mom. Right. Same thing with kids. You know, there's absenteeism because of they're taking care of a younger sibling uh, or an older grandparent. There's also problems with them not having time to do their homework. So right. I'm sure, you know, grades are failing. They're tired. They don't get enough well, well, sleep. Well, th that's what we call in business presenteeism. All right. As opposed to absenteeism, you show up, but you're so stressed or tired, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, or other directed that whatever you're responsible for doing doesn't happen that way. And so kids that can't concentrate in school because they're worried about how they left something at home or they know that as soon as they get out, they can't go to soccer today mm -hmm. because it's their day to take care of Johnny. Right. And, and so... Very uh, frustrating for very, them. Very, very frustrating. So that anybody that thinks that caregiving is simply a loving older 52-year-old daughter with a 74-year-old mother... That was a construct and a stereotype that's gone by the wayside. Caregiving happens at every age, yep. every level, across every social, socioeconomic. In every country and right. in every language. And that's why it's such a massive, massive problem. Right. And anybody that thinks that just because you have money, you've solved your caregiving issues, mm. you haven't. Because money can't take away or buy through the emotional involvement and once again go back to even things like guilt or even if you didn't like your mother mm -hmm. or you didn't like your father just to use <clears throat> a parent you can't avoid the emotion that's right that, that surrounds right it. I'm so glad that you're educating everyone it's very very important and I'm glad you're out there in the trenches I'm looking forward to your book coming out. Thank and you. If someone... Well, I think that's one of the reasons why the book got picked up. All right. It wasn't, you know, any other reason than I think they saw it as a real practical approach, you well, know, practical problem solving, yes. and it made sense. And the, the most interesting thing is one of the editors that's going through it now is involved in caregiving. Oh, and she said, go. while I'm going through this, I'm imagining myself. And, and she said, I found it to be, and I know that sounds self-serving, but uh, I found it to be very, very helpful. And so I understand why it works. That's right. And I'm so glad that you all joined us today. I want to thank you, David, for being My with pleasure, us. My pleasure, Marcia. You um, know how much I enjoy You want to stay tuned because when your book comes out, we're going to let you know about maybe how you can get a copy of it when the information is all available. We'll be sharing that with everybody. Thank you. I want uh, you all to um, have a good week. I want you to tune in next week for more Caregiver Solutions. And in the meantime, don't forget, give somebody a hug because they need it and so do you. So we'll see you next week. Take care. Thanks for joining us for this week's Caregiver Solutions with Marsha Teal. Join us next week as Marsha, who has 15 years of Alzheimer's disease and dementia care experience, brings you more needed information to help with the care of your loved one.
This show can be seen again on caregiversolutions.info and questions can be left on the site, which may be used on the program to help others. See you next week for more Caregiver Solutions. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program...